like to introduce Michael Sipser, our Dean of Science at MIT. He's the Donner Professor of Mathematics, and he's a member of MIT's Computer Science and Artificial Intell Intelligence Lab. His research areas are in algorithms and complexity theory. And being the sharp mathematical mind uh, that he is, he is the one who realized that um, George Bull and Claude Shannon were only born a year apart, but it was in different centuries. <laughs> and, and so he is, the, the, in essence, the, the creator of this symposium in the sense that it, once that realization was made by him, it was obvious uh, that we had to do this uh, around this time and how we had to do it. So uh, I'd like to call on, on Mike to uh, make his remarks. Thank you, Richard. Yeah, they're here. Shall I hook wire myself up? Sure. Yeah, the uh, observation about uh, the birthdays was uh, credits to Wikipedia. So uh, um, I guess we were originally think of, thinking about doing something together with UCC and MIT about George Boole, but the um, the relationship with uh, Shannon is it was a um, obviously a very strong one. Um, a lot of Shannon's work was built on Bull's work, and then when I, I saw that their birthdays were uh, almost at the same time, a century apart, it, it seemed like a great idea to have the uh, symposium around both of them. Um, so um, I've never given closing remarks before. Uh, I'm, I'm not exactly sure what I'm supposed to say. Um, uh, I, one thing I do want to say is thank you. Uh, th I want to thank all of the organizers and the people who were involved. I have a list. It's a bit long, but let me go through them. Um, uh, on the MIT side, Michael Louie, Yol Fink, Ananta Chandra Kassan, Krista Van Gilder, Mary Murphy, Sarana Fanning, Nina Wu uh, were all involved with uh, helping with uh, the planning and the arrangements for this. And on the UCC side, Jean Van Sinderen Law, Karen Kelly, Pedre Cantillon Murphy, Michael Murphy, the president of UCC, uh, Cronin, o Cronin o Doibilin, uh Michelle Shell Kens. Great, thank you. Emmanuel Popovici. Um, and then also uh, our honored guests, uh, Fionuela Quinlan, the Consul General of Ireland in Boston, and Fergal Brennick, president, Boston UCC alumni, and Rory Clune. Uh, UCC and MIT uh, alumnus. And lastly, I want to thank uh, all of you for being here. Uh, it's uh, great to be celebrating uh, the lives of uh, 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 George Bull and Claude Shannon, um, who have affected really just about everyone, uh, certainly everybody here, and, and have, and have uh, had a deep effect on me as well. And, and I think, you know, since I uh, uh, I figure everything sort of historical has already been said about these uh, two uh, great men. I would talk about sort of the, their personal effect on me, um, as, uh, because they both of them have had a huge effect. Uh, let me start with Boole. Um, Boole, um, uh, you know, he's, uh, my, my, my background is in theoretical computer science. Um, I, my, I, have, I was an undergraduate in mathematics. I was a graduate student in, uh, in computer science. And I really, my work blends both of them. And Boole has had a tremendous effect on both of those subjects. Uh, in particular, you know, in mathematics, um, you know, Boolean algebra um, and Boolean values, true and false, it really gives us the mathematics of, uh, of those. The, it's, the, it's the mathematics of true and false is really what he gave us. And it's such a fundamental thing that is no surprise that it's had such a tremendous effect on a number of different areas of mathematics, from algebra to combinatorics to logic. Uh, it's just been, um, you know, it, it, it's really hard to uh, overestimate the impact that Boole has had on uh, the world of mathematics. And then, you know, later on um, uh, in computer science, uh, you know, true and false are interpreted as one and zero often, and the these uh, uh, Boolean values, zero and one, or called binary values sometimes, uh, you know, they're they're the basis. They're the allows us to encode everything that we want to 
work on in computers. And so uh, both in, in mathematics and in computer science, um, uh, Boole has had a, a, a tremendous effect. Um, so he, uh, uh, I think, um, uh, oh, and I, I wanted to comment, I think part of my job as uh, making closing remarks, I'm supposed to comment on other people's presentations. Uh, I don't know if that's true, but I did, was trying to pay attention and uh, note down a few things. I know Phil, I wanted to thank Philip Fleming for his uh, discussions about mathematics and about the importance of uh, work in mathematics for um, its impact in, in engineering and in, in in computer science in particular. I do want to say that, though, I, th I think mathematicians don't only necessarily need to work on engineering problems. Uh, it's, uh, uh, I think, lots of, uh, uh, of mathematics that's found its way into application, just with lots of science that's found its way into application, has had its roots in basic research, where people are just trying to follow their curiosity and not necessarily work on problems that derive out of an obvious connection to an application uh, that they see, you know, up front. You know, if you can mention in particular, you know, the mathematics of mathematics, uh, which is really the, uh, the, the subject of mathematical logic, a lot of that has its roots in just trying to understand um, the, the nature of mathematical reasoning itself. What is a proof? What is truth? And things of that sort. And that's... Uh, led eventually to um, the kinds of thinking that uh, Turing and Gödel and von Neumann and so on had, which led to the, the, the computer industry. So, um, you know, the, the other, another example, for example, is number theory, which is the purest of pure subjects in mathematics, but led um, in non-trivial ways to uh, the public key, uh, cryptography that people use. And, um, you know, this, it's just one of many, many examples of basic research that's found its way into application. Anyway, um, I also wanted to comment on, in terms of uh, Boole's, uh, uh, I think it was M Michael Murphy, I have to make sure I get people's names right, Michael Murphy's comment about um, uh, putting the capital B on Boolean. Um, so I have a, let me see if I have my little chart here. I was. I was looking at the word Boolean on, on Google, uh, and so here is a historical trend of the use of the words uh, Boolean with a capital B, Boolean with a little b, and Boolean in all caps. <laughs> and uh, for some reason, the latter is sort of trending downward lately. I don't know quite why. Um, I don't, is this a pointer here? Yeah. So it had its peak up here. There must be some programming language that had this as a as a term that was used. But, you know, I think, in fact, when your name is used in, com is in, is in common usage without the capital, then you've really made it. <laughs> so I don't think we necessarily have to put the capital B on, on Boolean uh, to, to, uh, to, 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 to recognize the impact that he has had. Um, uh, on the world. I'm not quite sure what these numbers are, but uh, this must be the frequency out of all words or, or something. I'm not, I'm not sure. These are, come, comes out of books. Do you know uh, who the first person was to use the word I don't. And, you know, if you go back, you know, it, it was you, it's just down in the, uh, you know, uh, near zero, but not at zero, even at these earlier, uh, earlier points. So, um, uh, I, I don't know. Good question. Um, so, um, with that, I thought I would turn to uh, some of Shannon's work. I'm not going to speak for very long, by the way. Um, but I'm going to um, tell you uh, just a few anecdotes about how Shannon's work affected me in somewhat kind of unexpected ways, certainly in ways that I didn't expect. Um, when, uh, I think, it was, who was it that was uh, Robert Gray mentioned at age 13 uh, he had a gift of some kind of device. Is that right? You're here? Yeah. That was transformative for you. Same with me. I was 10. Um, not the same uh, device, though. Uh, my father, uh, who at the time was a high school math teacher, one day brought home uh, a thing called a Minivac. Minivac 601. It's a uh, little... They, it was built as a kind of a computer. Um, it, but it's basically a very simple thing. Um, 
It's a uh, um, plug board with uh, relays and buttons. And uh, you could sort of uh, connect it up with wires. Um, and you, the buttons could, you, you, you could make things happen, basically, with this thing. You could turn lights on. You can turn, you can, you can make a flip-flop. Um, and I, I was, you know, I, I was a nerdy little kid. I, I loved this thing. This was just the perfect gift for me. And I spent many, many, many hours playing with it, design. I mean, it had a bunch of exercises that you have to, uh, that you had to do. Um, you know, you had to wire up certain functions. I solved all the exercises. There were solutions in the back uh, of the uh, of the manual for for those. And in so, you know, at least in one case, my solution was much better than the one that was published in the manual. I even wrote a letter to the company saying, "My solution is better." They never answered. Oh well. Uh, but um, uh, years later, you know, I you know when the, the my, so eventually, my father took it back to. Uh, he got it. He was borrowing it from the high school where he was teaching. By the way, he wasn't. Uh, he wasn't mine. It was just a borrowed thing. But I think I kept it for for months and months. And certainly, I remembered very well. And then um, I, uh, you know, once things on the internet came around, I, I googled it. And, you know, does this thing? Where is it? And actually, this is a storied uh, early computer. Um, was actually designed by Claude Shannon, amazingly so. And so uh, I, uh, in fact, uh, then, then I became a father myself. I decided to uh, get one for my son uh, about, about seven years ago when he was turned to, when he was like 10 or 11 or so. Uh, could not compete with Xbox. <laughs> no, <laughs> you know, relays and buttons and lights. Not, not, it's just no, not, not close, no, no interest. Uh, he's, a, you know, he's at MIT now, and he's doing his cool things. But, um, so I had this thing sitting in my attic. So I, I brought it here just to show you. So I have it here. It's actually in, this, in this, my suitcase. Uh, <laughs> but it just amazed me. You know, it just had such a, so I, 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 this was, you know, so I bought it on eBay. Um, and in fact, I, if I can figure out how to open my suitcase, that would be that would, that would be even better. Um, I, I think I'm good. Yeah. So this is this is the Claude Shannon's. Sure. Well, I mean, these are relays here, and uh, they're just, it's a very simple thing. Relays, buttons, switches, um, you know, you can, the, the buttons can be, uh, they, they can turn on the circuit when they're pushed, or they can, on the other side, they, they push, they turn on the circuit when they're not pushed. And you can design the most cool things with just a simple circuit board like this. Now, no, I, now it's, I think they, you, obviously you can make a, a chip which does this and much more. Uh, um, you know, obviously, way more than that, but uh, uh, but um, I don't. For me, this was endless hours of fun. And um, anyway, so uh, uh, here's a. By the way, here's another picture of it. I think yeah. So this is, in case you can't see it, this is. So I bought this on eBay. Um, by the way, I was just looking as uh, you know. If you're if you're interested, there's there's another one for sale right now. Uh, <laughs> Uh, not this one. Uh, and I also saw that there's a Geniac for sale, too, by the way. So if, you, if you're interested in the, in, the, in the device that Robert Gray talked about, 355 bucks for the Geniac. This one's over 1,000, sorry. So uh, anyway, um, I think I got it for less, but I don't remember. It was years ago. Anyway, so that was my first little encounter with uh, um, Claude Shannon. Um, in, unknown, unbeknownst to me, that this was actually the thing that he designed, and I don't even know why he would design such a thing. Maybe he was trying, you know. He, you know, he was a bit of a tinkerer, and so maybe that was the reason. By the way, if you do look on eBay for it, you have to put the 601. Otherwise, you get all sorts of uh, things for small vacuum cleaners. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> So, uh, all right. So the next time I 
uh, kind of, again, sort of accidentally bumped into Claude Shannon's uh, uh, was when I was a, a graduate student um, at, at UC Berkeley. And uh, I, you know, I, was I was majoring in theory, computer theory, uh, which I'll talk a little bit about in a second. But, in, but I was, um, I, at, U at least at the time at UC Berkeley, you also had to have a minor subject. So I made, minored in computer hardware, you know, digital design. Um, this, this was the mid-70s, the days of the microprocessors, like uh, the, you know, these you know, 8080s, if you, if you remember those. Uh, the, I was working. So anyway, so there was a contest uh, there to design a microprocessor self-contained electronic mouse. Uh, this was an IEEE contest, um, and um, I, I think this is, was held for many years, maybe even still being held, I'm not sure. But this was the very first time it was held. So you had to design a, like a little uh, micro, microprocessor-controlled mouse, and uh, it was supposed to find its way out of a maze. That was, that was what the uh, contest was about. And so um, uh, I just thought this was a cool idea. I knew nothing about doing Make you a little robot, which is essentially what you had to do, and so, but you know, we tr tried to reason our way through it. Um, and I worked with another guy. Actually, I have a picture of me and him from back then. <laughs> this is the thing we built, <laughs> um, and uh, you put the thing inside a um, a little maze. So we had little sample mazes that we can re uh, reorganize, and um, it. Uh, Never worked. <laughs> Look good, but it's really hard to do something like that, as I learned. Uh, and there were other people. They were really good engineers. They really knew how to, you know. We went to the contest, um, and um, they, uh, we were just totally blown away by, by, the, by the competition, I'm, uh, I have to say. But you know who else was there? Claude Shannon. Why was Claude Shannon? So I got to meet him. Uh, Claude Shannon was there because, as I mentioned, he was a tinker. And he had built also a kind of electronic uh, mouse. Uh, here's a picture of him and his mouse. Um, this was years earlier. Um, it's a little bit of a cheat because the requirements for us was that all of the smarts for the mouse, for the electronic mouse, had to be on board. His thing was there was a whole thing not shown here underneath which actually did all the controlling. This was just, you know, uh, just, you know, the, the, the piece on top, but it was being pulled around by a magnet underneath, and there was a huge number of, uh, a huge amount of electronics underneath it. But anyway, so he, but he had been the, basically the first uh, to uh, co come up with this idea of a robot mouse, in effect, and so he was there. Uh, I got to meet him, uh, you know, charming gray-haired guy, just, you know, like the pictures. His wife was there, wife Betty was there too. And um, you know, there was, we were all on TV. It was, it was kind of a fun experience. Um, and I remember talking to him a little bit. Um, that, you know, this was, again, uh, mid 70s, I would say. Um, I asked him what he was doing. He said, we're working on genealogy. Uh, he said, I've discovered that my wife and I were, are related. <laughs> we're, we're eighth cousins. <laughs> Sticks in my mind, right, to this day. Anyway, um, so he was just the kind of guy. He just did what, what, whatever appealed to him, you know. Uh, anyway, so, um, so that's the, sort of the second time I kind of crossed pairs with uh, Claude Shannon. Um, uh, now, the next time after that, where I was still a graduate student, uh, where I kind of sort of ran into Claude Shannon was when I fell in love with a math problem. <laughs> um, and that problem is, was mentioned already here. Uh, it's the P versus NP question, which I've spent a good chunk of my career thinking about in one form or another. It's another thing which I have not managed to solve, but oh well. Uh, but um, so this is an area that the, the P versus NP problem, it was mentioned briefly, and maybe I can just try to state it in my own words briefly, because it's really a simple thing. Um, but it really touches both on Boole and on Shannon um, in terms of uh, as 
early, uh, uh, you, know, who, you know, whose work kind of influenced, you know, it can be seen as, in a sense, precursor work to uh, this P versus MP question. P versus MP question is very simple. It just says that there are certain kinds of problems, computational tasks, where it looks like you have to, by, it looks like that solving them uh, requires searching for the answer. And no one knows if you really need to search. The problem is with searching is it takes a long time. And maybe if you can avoid the search, you can solve the problem more quickly. So the, the classic example is, the, is this one. So if you, if you have two very large numbers, like numbers with hundreds of digits, and you may think, well, you know, why be concerned with such big numbers like two numbers with 500 digits each? Those are huge, huge numbers in terms of their magnitude. But to write them down, it's not so bad, just 500 digits. And the reason why um, those actually are used in application, it has to do with this RSA cryptography. The, 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 that whole thing really does have find its application, not because we're really counting up to that value, but because the, the multiplication is a manipulation that's relevant to sort of encryption. It doesn't really matter. The, the point that I want to make is that you can take those two 500-digit numbers and multiply them to get the 1,000-digit product in a fraction of a second, even on your laptop, obviously, obviously. And they would just use the procedure that you learned in third grade for doing multiplication, just the ordinary procedure for multiplying those two 500-digit numbers, you know, using basically a shift and adding approach, uh, can be implemented so quickly um, on, a, on a computer that it, you can get the answer in a second. But if you want to reverse the process, so I give you the product, I want to figure out what the two numbers that multiply together to, to give that product, that's the factoring problem. So given the product, I want to find the, the two factors, or however many factors there are, there are. We don't know how to solve that problem in general without actually looking for the factors. There's no procedure which sort of constructs the factors out of the product in the way that you can construct the product out of the factors. And so, uh, uh, you know, doing that reverse multiplication pr problem it just takes, you know, if for, for a thousand digit products to find the factors, in general, more time than you have in the lifetime of the universe, even on the fastest possible computer. There are just too many possibilities to search through. Now, the question mathematically is whether you can find a way of doing factoring that avoids that search. Can you sort of home in on the answer and construct the answer in a way that you construct the product? You know, if you're going, if you're doing the multiplication, nobody knows. And it's really the essence of what P, the P versus NP question is. There are just many other cases where um, we, know, we can solve a problem by searching, but no one knows if you can avoid the search and just home in on the answer directly. And you know, I'm not, I don't want to say it formally, but that's really the essence of what, you know, P, if P equals NP, that means you can uh, solve all of these problems without searching. P is different from NP, means that there are really some problems that need searching. You can't avoid it. Okay, so, uh, um, and so that's the, th you know, I, I got very interested in this problem as a graduate student. I spent an enormous part of my career working on sort of variations of this problem in one, in one way or another. Uh, some, some ways there was success, some ways there was not. Um, but uh, you can, so I, I uh, can trace, you know, so I wrote a paper a while ago on the history of the P versus NP problem. And so this was a quote, I quotes from various different sources about things that preceded P versus NP. P versus NP, by the way, has its a root. Uh, it was stated formally in the early 70s. So this is way earlier. And you know, without getting into the whole thing here, it, it, Shannon is really, so this is a quote from, his pa from this paper he wrote as a Bell, Bell Labs Technical Journal uh, uh, article. Uh, he is trying to um, talk about building these circuits that solve various kinds of, comp compute various different uh, mathematical functions, various different functions. You, you build sort of a digital circuit with AND gates and OR gates and so on. And so uh, he talks about the problem to show that a circuit is the most economical one uh, for a given function. How do you know that the, f the circuit that you've actually found cannot be f improved further to give a smaller one? 
So this is a, t a kind of searching problem. Um, and it's conceivable that you could do that test without searching. You can just have a, you know, some sort of uh, procedure which will tell you is your circuit, that will minimize your circuit for you. Now you, you, you put in a circuit and it'll construct the actual minimum circuit that computes the same thing. We don't know how to do that. You could in principle do that by searching through all possible circuits, testing each one to see whether they're all possible smaller circuits, I should say, seeing whether each one of them is equivalent to the original, which itself takes some work. But, um, uh, you know, but no one knows how to do that. No one knows if there's a way of minimizing circuits without expending a tremendous amount of computational effort to do so. Um, and so really, so he's talking about that. The difficulty spreads from the large number of essentially different networks available and from the lack of a simple mathematical idiom for representing these circuits. I mean, I think being a little bit liberal about the interpretation, he's kind of saying, is there a more clever thing that you can do than just the brute force search here? And that's really, again, the essence of what P versus NP is. is you know, for these searching problems, you have to just do the dumb thing one after the another, try, 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 or is there something where you can be more clever? Okay, and uh, so he was sort of a little bit getting at that in this early paper, and I kind of like that too. Um, so now, I'm near the end of my time, uh, there were two little bits of touch points with Shannon that happened more recently in my life. Um, I became uh, the um, uh, head of the math department here at MIT about uh, 12 years ago, and uh, did that job for about a decade. For a decade, and um, one of the things you know that you do is, I'm sure people in administration know, you go out and raise money. Okay, so that I spend time trying to uh, raise money for the math department. Actually, that worked. It wasn't as turned out to be not as unpleasant as I thought it might be. It was actually kind of fun. Um, in some ways, and we ha and we ha especially because it was successful, uh, that ha always helps. And so what we did manage to raise some money. In particular, we raised money from a um, uh, friend of the math department, uh, John Reed, and his wife uh, Cindy Reed. Uh, so they gave us um, uh, two endowed chairs for the math department, which was very, was very generous of them. And even more generous, they didn't uh, ask that we um, uh, um, name them after, after them. Um, it's actually, I'm, 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 so it was one endowed chair and a number of graduate fellowships, in fact. So there was another endowed chair that came from a different source. So it was one endowed chair, a number of graduate fellowships. And they didn't insist that the chair be named after them. They said, why don't you name it for some important mass mathematician historically at MIT? So, there were two obvious candidates. There was Shannon and there was Norbert Wiener. Now, fortunately, I didn't have to pick between them uh, because Norbert Wiener, there was already a Wiener chair in the department. So that was nice. So I suggested Claude Shannon. They were happy with that idea. And so we now have a Claude Shannon professorship in the math department here because you know I, I didn't I neglected to mention Shannon was a member of the math department at MIT. He was also, he was a, had a joint appointment within um, mathematics here and also um, uh, in EEC, in e, well, originally it was EE. He had an appointment jointly with EE and in math at MIT. And so it, uh, you know, I, I thought it was important to honor his legacy um, uh, in the math department. And it was great that we had this opportunity to name a chair for him. Um, and lastly, the last little bit is also has to do with, uh, sort of the end of my story, has to do with uh, Dowd chairs. Um, uh, Shannon himself, when he was here at MIT, uh, was, had uh, a named chair and a Dowd chair. He was the, the, uh, the Donner professor. Uh, um, and uh, um, you may or may, not, may or may not know, I think it's not so much a tradition here in the United States, but more in, in at least in some place in, like a, in Cambridge, uh, the other Cambridge, there is, uh, you know, th there are certain en endowed professorships which have a, a history themselves. So for example, um, the um, uh, Isaac Newton, 
uh, held the Lucasian, if I'm pronouncing, pronouncing it right, chair at Cambridge University. And that chair has passed on to uh, many other very distinguished people, such as uh, Charles Bag Babbage uh, held the Lucasian chair subsequently, and, uh, and then Stephen Hawking held the chair. So there's, you know, there, you know, these chairs themselves have a have a um, certain uh, uh, history and a quality to them. We don't do that so much here, but I noticed that Shannon held this Donner uh, professor professorship, and so um, uh, when I uh, became dean, I said. Uh, I would mind be I don't know where because it still exists at MIT and I said I would like to be the Donner professor if there was some way to make that happen. So I, I'm happy to say just as of January I became the Donner professor. As if you heard though that's how I was announced. So I was thank you. And that made me happy. Uh, so anyway, that pretty that concludes my uh, concluding talk of, of the of the day. It's been a wonderful day. I really didn't expect to stay all day long, but the talks were just so interesting. Um, that uh, I really enjoyed it. I want to thank uh, the speakers um, for their great presentations. And I want to thank you all for being here to celebrate the lives of these two great men. I want and also want to thank uh, Richard and Muriel for be, having hosted this, uh, this event. <laughs>